Welcome back, everybody. I hope that you enjoy your coffee. We did. And now we can move to our third speaker of this morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Binya Legenager. She's a professor at the University of Zurich and head of the research group Cognitive Neuropsychology with focus on body self and plasticity. She did her PhD in neuroscience at the EPFL in Lausanne. After two postdoctoral stays in Rome and Bern, she was a junior group leader at the University Hospital in Zurich. And her work focuses on the empirical investigation of multisensory integration mechanisms, the bodily self, and the body cognition in both pathology and health. And today she will present her talk titled Touching the Self, the role of touch in embodiment and bodily illusion. Thank you, Binya. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Totally yes. well. Yeah, okay, because I don't see you guys anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, today. And uh, I think it's especially appealing especially somehow appeal. to, to, I hear my I own hear my mm -hmm. Is that Now it's better, okay. Um, so it's especially appealing to talk, I think, about touch if already we're not able to meet in person uh, and touch. So I'll try, as you mentioned, to talk about a few studies that we've done trying to investigate the role of touch and especially also self-touch in embodiment and bodily illusions. Um, but let me start by briefly uh, explaining to you what I mean by embodiment. And of course, this is a term that has been used very widely in, the, in different contexts. But for today, I would just like to use it, uh, define the term, as this basic sense that we have of um, being a physical body in the world. And this includes very, various different aspects, such as just this sense of presence, being in the world, the first person perspective uh, that we have on our own body and uh, on the environment as well, feeling of ownership, uh, feeling of agency, but also uh, body image. So to know um, where the body starts and end, what the position of the limbs. Um, are. And all of these different aspects help us kind of uh, to distinguish self from others and from the outside. And these different aspects are very normally perceived as very stable and they're really fundamental aspects of human experience. However, even if they are stable, it's thought that um, this sense of the body and embodiment is constructed on a moment by moment basis. Um, by integrating um, and weighting different sensor input um, with some sort of top, like in a bottom up way, with top down um, expectancy or priors. And I really like to quote here Stratton because I think he beautifully described this in 1899 in this paper entitled The Spatial Harmony uh, of Touch and Sight. Um, he mentions that. While, of course, somehow the experience has to meet our expectations, um, what is very crucial is the perfect uniformity between different sensory signals, for example, between touch and sight. Uh, and this synchrony between different senses has been described to be really crucial, uh, not only in the, in the momentary embodiment, but also in the development um, of, of the sense of embodiment and this distinction between self and others. And we have heard already this morning, this really fascinating studies that already, and I think we will hear more about that also tomorrow, that already newborns um, detect synchrony between different uh, stimuli, for example, between visual tactile stimuli or visual auditory stimuli and integrate them in some way. And um, as we will probably also be here tomorrow again, is that this integration and the different weighting uh, develops also um, over, over uh, lifespan. But we can also use this drive of the brain uh, to, to detect and integrate synchronous signals coming from different um, sensory systems in order to um, manipulate kind of the borders 
of, of embodiment and to manipulate different aspects of the body itself. Uh, as, for example, in the famous rubber hand illusion that you all know, where the visual information about a tactile event, so a touch and the tactile information um, is provides kind of conflicting information leading to the rubber hand uh, to be perceived as one's own hand. And in the lab, we have spent quite a lot of um, effort and time trying to use these techniques to alter various aspects um, of embodiment, for example, also self-location. Um, but uh, more recently, we're also working um, with this paradigm that has been developed by Be Another Lab, this artist science group, um, where people um, can, through the head mounted display, see the perspective of another person's body uh, online and giving the impression that you embody online another person. And again, through touch, you can increase this feeling uh, by providing synchronous information about the touch seen on the other person and the one felt on your own body. Um, but there's also um, illusions that you can induce uh, where, for example, body image is very differently. So in this study, we showed that people can identify um, with a grapefruit if, for example, you squeeze. And this is, again, this, this match of the visual information about the touch being on the grapefruit and the tactile sensation on your own um, body. So using this um, visual tactile uh, synchronous but conflicting information, you can induce rather surprising alterations uh, of the sense of uh, embodiment. But um, as Sarah already really nicely uh, introduced in the last talk, um, these previous studies or this, in these studies, we kind of showed that you can use um, synchrony in order to alter embodiment and to make people feel like being in another body or in another place. However, what um, we started to use more recently in the lab is trying to do kind of the opposite, like an inverse rubber hand illusion, and trying to break with the expected synchrony um, of different uh, multisensory signals. And this is also, in our opinion, um, more interesting in a way to link it to clinical conditions, uh, which we also heard about showing uh, deficits in, in body ownership, typically um, uh, a sort of disownership for their own body. So the paradigms that we use, and again, I think Sarah introduced it probably uh, much better than I can do it. Um, but the basic idea is that uh, you, through the head mountain display, you see the environment either with an infra camera or with an actual video um, as, as the reality. And what we do then is by introducing a delay, um, we, we disentangle kind of, or we put this, uh, we, this mismatch, this temporal mismatch uh, between the tactile sensation and the visual, uh, as, or the visual sensation of touch. And what we have shown over many studies now already is that this leads to the sense of disownership in healthy participants. What Sarah also described already is that we try to um, um, not use like, I mean, to, to do it in a very short time, uh, trying to break the synchrony and to repeat it um, uh, stimuli, where we have very short stimulation time, but at different uh, delays. And this is just a video to show. So the participant is touched uh, and then should reply uh, whether this was perceived as synchronous or not. And then how strongly they identify uh, with this body or how strong the ownership is for the touched hand, actually, which is important for afterwards. And what we can then do is plot um, the, the function or the ownership, the perceived ownership as a function of uh, the delay that we introduce. And what we could show here in this uh, first study is um, that visual motor synchrony, so we also had the people moving the hand instead of being touched, was a bit more effective in, uh, effective in general to um, break this sense of ownership. However, in both conditions, what you can see here is that with increasing delay, the, the sense of ownership um, decreased. Um, so these um, studies that I mentioned now, they show basically, again, that by experimentally manipulating multisensory information, uh, you can quite systematically manipulate the sense of the body or the sense of embodiment um, on, a, on a temporary uh, level. 
But um, so far, I've only talked about passive touch. So what about active touch? Um, and for the rest of the talk, I would like to um, talk about self-touch and embodiment, because self-touch um, is a very special case uh, of touch in which the body is at the same time the perceiver and the perception uh, or the perceiver and the object of perception. And with that, it creates this rich um, intermodal redundancy of different sensory, multi-sensory cubes. And it has been suggested to have an important role uh, in um, fine tuning the sense of your own body and in updating also, again, on a moment by moment uh, basis, the sense of embodiment. And indeed, I mean, if we look at, uh, oh, this, so, <laughs> this should baby. not have a sound. So if we look at um, the, the, the baby, the womb already, you can see that uh, it touches a lot the own body, uh, she or he, and also um, external touch. And it has been shown also again that for newborns already, they make a difference uh, between self-touch or not. So for example, if they touch, by chance their cheek, they would not show this or let's show this uh, rooting reflex that is shown uh, if someone else is touches uh, their cheek. Um, so, and of course, this conflicting information about self-touch has also been used previously to alter embodiment similar to the illusions that I showed you before. Um, famously, for example, in the Pinocchio illusion, um, which where participant typically would touch the nose of another person and then feel the touch on their nose, um, leading to the, to the extension or felt extension of their uh, nose, which um, we recently replicated also in a virtual reality setup where um, you would see the nose growing while still tapping on the nose. Or um, also in the so-called numbness illusion, which I think is an interesting demonstration because it involves a lot of touch and it's a quite a complex illusion uh, of touch. Where um, and I think I would, if someone has not yet tried that out, please try it as soon as you have someone uh, next to you, where you put the hands together and then someone strokes on the two in index fingers, um, and then this would cause a sort of numbness, but in the other person's hand. So mixing up uh, with this self other distinction. Um, but then also, uh, if we look at self touch as compared to um, other touch, uh, it has also been shown in rubber hand illusion like uh, paradigm that self touch enhances the illusion. Uh, this was done in a robot robotic um, rubber hand illusion setup where people could touch uh, themselves, I mean, could apply touch on the rubber hand, which increased uh, the sense of ownership towards that hand. And we've also heard again um, about this clinical condition. It has also been shown that clinical conditions of this ownership um, might be reduced during uh, self-stroking so that they um, show a decreased uh, symptom of disembodiment during self-touch. So we were interested to see whether um, we could find the same thing using um, or find the same modulation using our paradigm that I described before and that actually Sarah already uh, described. So I will try to be rather brief on that. But what we did is that we compared um, other stroking with self-stroking in exactly the same um, setup. And what we could show is that again, if you plot this sense of ownership as a function of time, um, that um, with the increasing delay, uh, as, as shown before, the, the sense of embodiment would decrease, but this was stronger um, for the other condition as compared to the self condition, suggesting that kind of the self touch protects you uh, from feeling the sense of disownership. Um, what's also interesting that on a subjective level, uh, people feel really that it's much, much less strange if someone else touches them than if they, than if they do the self-touch. So there's really this difference uh, in perception. Um, but also if we try to measure it with questionnaire, actually the, the results are a bit less exciting, but still we find this difference um, that people doing self-touch uh, report independently of the synchrony actually uh, a decreased sense of disownership and an in and the increased sense of uh, embodiment compared to the other touch. 
So um, this suggests that, yeah, as I said, that there is less disownership uh, during the self-touch. However, so far, I've only talked about um, the self or the, the ownership sensation of the touched hand. But as I said, this is the interesting part of self-touch as well, that it's both like you're both touching as well as being touched at the same time. So how does the ownership of the touching hand kind of in, or plays uh, a role into this integration? If we look at um, previous literature, it has been shown uh, that sensory attenuation, and this has been suggested to be an implicit measure of self other distinction. Uh, so this is basically the idea that if you touch your own body, that uh, the sensory signal would be attenuated as compared to an external, um, or if someone else is touches uh, your body. And it has previously shown by this study by Kiltani and Erson um, that this depends, this index, the, the amount of attenuation uh, depends on the ownership uh, of a rubber hand in the rubber hand um, illusion paradigm. So um, we were using for our studies, the two last studies that I will present now, we were using a bit of different uh, measure that was mentioned already uh, also in the talk before, which is tickling sensation. So tickling sensation, and I plotted here this very nice tickling machine that has been used in the famous uh, paper by Weisskranz. Um, tickling has been used as a sort of uh, self other measure as well, because it has been shown that other people can tickle you, but you can not tickle yourself. And as mentioned before already, uh, it has shown that it has been shown that this difference between self and other is dampened in uh, individuals with uh, disorders of embodiment, like for example, schizophrenia, but also for example, if you wake up from REM dream, which has been suggested also to be linked to this self-other um, confusion that you might have uh, during dreaming. Um, so we were interested in uh, investigating this altered sense of embodiment in a natural condition of an altered sense of embodiment using prosthesis. So what we um, did together with uh, Bekrat Dorfman and his team we uh, investigated the difference between self-touch, other touch, and um, prosthesis touch. So we asked participants to tickle themselves on the feet, on the sole of, the, of, of one of their foot, uh, either with their um, normally functioning hand or with the prosthesis or with um, uh, or someone or ask someone else to touch. And what we found here is depicted the sensory score. So this is basically how tickling it felt. And we can replicate what has been replicated many times that the other touch feels uh, more ticklish than the self-touch. Um, interestingly, the prosthesis touch was um, not different from self-touch, but was also reduced um, in, in comparison to other touch, suggesting that the prosthesis um, is that the sensory attenuation or this difference in self-other um, is similar for the prosthesis as compared to self-touch. And this could be linked uh, maybe to this idea uh, that the reason for not being able to tickle, which goes back to Darwin, is that you have actually, you already predict um, the, the sensory input because you exactly know where and when you will touch. Um, but then what, what might be even more interesting somehow is that even if we find this general um, reduction of self-other difference, this self-other difference, um, which we calculated here an index, uh, which refers to the how strong this difference was between um, self and other, it's positively correlated uh, to the sense of embodiment of their own prosthesis in amputees. This data are um, really underpowered because we only had um, 13 upper limb amputees. However, it suggests that um, this prosthesis embodiment somehow links also uh, to this attenuation um, effects. And just staying uh, a little bit with prosthesis, I mean, it has been suggested that it's really important that people feel embodiment for their own, or amputees feel embodiment for their prosthesis. And we were wondering whether we could, um, this and now in healthy participants, 
uh, evoke one of these complex tactile illusions by using um, uh, a prosthesis device. And I will just play you this video briefly. Um, so we try to induce the numbness illusion in, by a robotic device that had actually active sensors uh, here um, that would, whenever the, the, the robotic hand touches, they would give a, a signal um, to the index finger and the thumb thing. And we were wondering whether um, this could also invoke, uh, if you really feel that the prosthesis is their own, that this would also uh, evoke this numbness illusion. However, while we found a numbness illusion for the real hand, we did not find one at all for the robotic hand, um, which just suggests that just the information that you get about the touch might not be enough um, to get to this weird sensation of numbness in the other person's hand. And actually, if you're interested in it, we have published with a lot of engineers and people working with amputees, um, uh, a review paper on how we think that you would have to increase or uh, this tactile sensation or improve the tactile sensation for prosthetics in order to ideally get to the point that people could use the prosthetics in a way like their own hand and would basically even get to the feeling of this uh, complex uh, illusion. So um, I think I have to hurry up a little bit for the last part of the talk. I just wanted to say that so far I presented um, data in healthy participants um, in normal waking state. However, I think it's also very interesting to look at this interaction between touch uh, and embodiment in different altered states of consciousness. And uh, for example, in dreams, which is a very, very interesting um, condition in which you get this near complete disconnection of the body from, um, from the brain. And you can basically look at how the, the embodiment or, um, is simulated in the brain in dreams. Uh, and if we go back to like my first slide, um, you get this sense of embodiment in dreams as well. So being in a dream, this sense of presence is typically uh, described also an internal first person perspective in one uh, physical body at the time. I mean, physical dream body. Um, this feeling of ownership, is clearly there. Typically, you identify only with one dream character, um, while there's typically other two to four um, non-dream selves. Uh, you also have the feeling of agency to a certain degree. And the body image schema might be much less defined than in healthy, uh, than in normal state. Um, and for example, touch seems to be underrepresented. However, uh, there's also really very few studies done on that. And we, for example, showed in one study where we tried to manipulate um, dream, the dream body using a TDCS during sleep. Uh, we asked very specifically about different bodily sensations during dream. And we could show here actually that tactile somatosensory um, information or like experience is not that rare if you specifically ask about it. So um, what we were interested is in, look at this um, sensory attenuation effect in dreams. So we used uh, Lucid Dreamer for that, that we recruited online and used the paradigm that has previously been used, for example, to show that um, people activate very similar motor areas when dreaming uh, about moving as compared to when um, being awake. So we uh, ask them to actually being tickled, to imagine tickled, and to ask in the dream another character to tickle themselves. Um, and then uh, we asked about tickling sensation and also free dream report. Um, almost 70 people filled out this um, or started with the waking part, but only nine out of them managed to do this very complex task uh, in dreaming. Um, so again, these data have to be taken really carefully because it's, again, very underpowered and it's also a very complex uh, setup. But what we found is that while in awakening, we find again this, this classic um, effect that has been replicated many times. Actually, in imagery, we have a very similar um, effect. But then in dreams, we did not find any difference between self-tickling and other tickling, suggesting that this uh, attenuation uh, of self-touch specific is uh, not present uh, in dreams. And um, this might be 
um, what you saw is also that there's like a general lower sense of um, tickling and intensity, which could be linked to this general attenuation uh, that I that I showed before. The tactile sensation in dreams seems to be rather very generally. Um, but also it could be linked to the fact that the precise timing is known. Even if people phenomenologically feel like feel like it's another person, of course it's created uh, by their, their brain and the exact uh, moment of touch is known. So that could be the underlying effect. Um, one thing that um, kind of speaks for that is that in dream reports, um, they reported that um, touch by people whom they didn't have control over in the dream would feel more ticklish as well. However, I think this is just a, to give you a first glance into uh, this exciting topic of studying uh, touch and self-touch and embodiment in dreams and um, further um, experiments are certainly needed. So with that, I would like to thank um, the uh, SNF for funding and especially also my team and my external collaborators, and of course you all um, for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Binya, for your very interesting talk. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we have time for questions. Uh, so I read the first one. Um, the first one is from uh, uh, Francis McLoone. So uh, it is uh, essential when studying skin-to-skin uh, -skin self touch that the anatomy is taken into account. Laboratory skin does not contain C tactile afferents, airy skin does. Virtually all rubber and illusion studies stroke ST innervated skin, but see uh, Dickerman study. CTs are hypothesized to play a fundamental, uh, fundamental role, sorry, Yes, to play a fundamental role in the developing the sense of self. Have you looked at the role of CTs in your experiments? No, unfortunately, we also haven't looked at that at all. And I agree also with uh, what Sarah said already before, that it would be really interesting to investigate. But no, we, we did not look at that so far. OK. Uh, so um, um, I take the opportunity to ask you a, qu a question. So it's just a curiosity. So I was thinking uh, uh, about your latest work and your presentation about a sort of a prosthesis illusion or something like this, that. So um, maybe do you think that uh, uh, this could be used as a tool uh, in a rehabilitation for patients? So I am referring to clinical condition in some ways. So you mean, what exactly could be used to, I mean, I think so, for prosthesis, yes. I mean, I think this would be the idea and it's also what was part of in, in this article, no? that I think the more you, the more natural you could kind of simulate touch with all the different aspects. And I think we will hear about that also more later on, no? like effective touch, uh, but also Typically, if you talk to people developing prosthesis, touch is mainly linked to um, active touch no? and the senses on the fingertip. While I think it's really important to be able to somehow simulate also this more complex um, sensation yeah. of touch. Like, for example, doing the numbness illusion. Actually, if you try to do the numbness illusion with a rubber hand, it's also much less strong because you might not get no, the temperature sensation that makes it feel like a human hand and so on. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Still a long way, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so I think that uh, we can stop because we are in schedule. <laughs> so we thank you so much, Binya, for your amazing talk. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. And so now uh, we can move to.